good afternoon to everybody. Um, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to the panel on sign language solutions. Uh, the Zero Project uh, uh, website uh, stated that this session introduces a range of initiatives promoting and supporting greater use of sign language in political, educational, and social contexts. But I think the gist of this panel is basically communication and seeing the person behind the disability. Um, um, and I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Michal Rimon. Uh, my sign language name is Michal. It's a name that I was given by my workers. Uh, I can tell you that when I come home and tell them that this is my name, my kids crack up because they don't really understand the context. You are a commander. Uh, but that's the beauty of it. Uh, either you or your uh, uh, colleagues, the deaf community, can give you a name. Uh, and uh, I invite each one of my panelists, if you have such a name, share it with us. Um, and anybody sitting here can adopt a name later. Um, the presentation. We have, I will introduce the panelists, each one, before they uh, uh, speak. And I wanted to focus uh, on uh, creating a trend with sign language. Uh, I can tell you that in uh, Israel, um, uh, I am coming from Access Israel, and Access Israel is an organization where accessibility is our name, but it's not our uh, goal. It is the means to an end, the goal being inclusion, true inclusion of everyone, all types of disability in all areas of life, uh, with dignity, with respect, as equals and with maximum uh, independence. Um, and uh, you see uh, the Zero, Pro product, uh, Zero Project logo, the Access Israel logo, and the logo below is a project that we uh, incorporated into our organization uh, um, several years ago, I think it's about uh, six years ago, amazing project called Pay It Forward in Sign Language. Uh, and I think it's one of the gems that Access Israel uh, really uh, holds. Uh, it's a project that basically um, made the sign language in Israel, or at least one of the contributors to the fact that sign language in Israel today is a trend. Thousands and thousands of people who have nothing to do with the deaf community, don't know anyone who is deaf, uh, is signing and learning how to sign basic communicative uh, uh, skills. Um, because we are all part of the same society, we all go to the same places, why not? Uh, be able to talk the same language. And it has become a trend, and I would like to share a little bit uh, on that. I can even tell you that in the past years, um, there has been a real increase, if I'm not mistaken, double the number of people who are going to learn professional sign language following this program. So um, this is something we're very uh, proud of. Statistics. Uh, in Israel, we're talking about uh, 1,600,000 people with disability, about 18% of the population. That is all types of disabilities. We have uh, 850,000 people with hearing disabilities. That's not counting my father, who keeps saying that he hears fine. It's just the acoustics in my house is not good. Uh, so this number, of course, is, is an estimate only. And 15,000 uh, uh, people consider sign language as their mother tongue or a dominant language. Um, when I was preparing this uh, um, a presentation, um, I was uh, uh, amazed to, to find out that 90% of the children with hearing disabilities are born to hearing families and 75% uh, are not taught sign language from birth. Um, uh, and again, as I said before, uh, paid for it in sign language, there were only uh, about 80 uh, interpreters, professional interpreters. Today, it's almost double. Really quickly, accessibility people easily think about the physical aspects, but we know that the physical is not enough. Israel has regulations about accessible services, which is great, but again, that gives you a lie, maybe the, the know-how on how to uh, give good services, but it doesn't really change the DNA. What we are promoting here is the social accessibility, and only if you incorporate and, and, and put an effort on that, then you will have a true social inclusion. Uh, the way we're doing it uh, is basically a combination of steps. 
tools for social accessibility. Um, uh, we call it the four pillars. First of all, knowledge to get to know the per to get to know uh, uh, information. If we're talking about sign language, about the deaf community, uh, we just now had a funny uh, incident where uh, I tried to sign the name of one of the panelists, and in Israel sign language that's fine. In their sign language, it was a big, big no-no. You have to know these things. Once you know something, you're less afraid of it. Um, the next thing is experiencing it, learning it. The next one is getting to know the person behind the disability, making the connection, and then paying it forward, having the tools to go and spread the word. In the project that I was talking about, uh, for many years it was free, today it's for a very small amount, and you're only obligated for one thing, teach one more person this project, this language, and then we'll spread the word. I won't go into uh, all the slides because I am the chairperson of this session and I have to set an example, but I can tell you that this project is a 12 lesson, six meeting, two hours each uh, program, which uh, deaf people are paid, which is great because before that they did not have uh, any job. They are paid and they are professional instructors teaching in 12 hours basic skills to communicate sharing who they are, the beauty of their culture, um, uh, and basically breaking the, the gaps and building bridges. Uh, and I can tell you again, it's all ages, kids, adults, combination uh, were very, very successful. Um, in the class, from the first second of this uh, course, no talking. It's only use of body language and signs. And it's amazing how quickly Kids and adults mm -hmm. catch on. Um, the business model, I will just give you, uh, th these are course aids that we have, all kinds of uh, screenshots with words, um, alphabets, videos. Uh, but when I'm talking about creating a trend, I'll tell you two funny things. Uh, we do it in schools, we do it for uh, professionals, um, uh, but one of the courses that I love the most is that we convince, uh, Eilat is one of our southern uh, uh, cities, uh, a great tourism and tourist attraction place, and we convince the divers club to learn sign language because, hey, underwater, we're all deaf. We cannot communicate, communicate anywhere uh, uh, otherwise. And it was amazing to see how people understand that the added value of this uh, uh, thing. And if I was uh, titling my lecture in creating a trend, I think that the best tool that we used is taking this issue of disability and making it into a fun thing, trendy. We took VIPs, all kinds of celebs, because what can we do? We're a society that loves celebs, and taught them basic sign language in a song. And we started creating a trend of songs uh, that are videoed by um, uh, people who went through our courses and basically spread the word. And people start signing. Uh, today it is really trendy. You see it in uh, graduations, you see it in parties, you see it in kindergarten. And it has become something that you do not avoid, you don't feel uncomfortable with, but rather you embrace. And this is something that is very uh, uh, successful. I have one more minute, so if you can operate just a, big, uh, a small thing, we gathered more than 500 people who went to the courses, learned this song, Jews, Arabs, young, old, everyone, if you can give me just 30 seconds of it. Whoever is blind, who am I? I'm just human. I live and work like everyone else. I see a future and always think that the intent gives us faith. I have no fear, I've got a feeling that the road is going to be rough. I see a future and always think that the intent gives us faith. And you can lower it because I'm over with time and I want to say one more sentence. I'm sitting here before you, but the real minds behind this project are 
two amazing people, Sarel Ochana, uh, who was a, an, an award, uh, awardee of uh, uh, Zero Project a couple of years ago, and Jonathan Shiov, it's a project manager that leads this uh, uh, amazing project, and it's something we're very proud of, and I'm excited to hear from our panelists other uh, solutions and uh, innovations uh, promoting this uh, uh, very, very important uh, issue. So, thank you very much, and I'm on time, right? Guys, I was on time. Let's see you guys, okay? Good. So, my next speaker is Nick Delahun, director of Wigital. Wigital. Um, great. Uh, he specializes in the use and application of technology to create content communication channels for interpersonal or person and business purposes. And his passion is enabling others and creating and facilitating communication. Um, their product, FingerTalk, is South Africa's first sign language app that allows users to learn SASL, search for signs in the dictionary, test their knowledge with fun quizzes and send signs via social media and WhatsApp, allowing them to communicate in sign language via traditionally text-based me media. Please. Hello, everyone. Um, I don't think I need to present anymore. I think you did uh, my, my job for me there. Um, hello from South Africa. Um, so we have a big problem in South Africa. Um, our numbers are fairly large when it comes to South African Sign Language, uh, or when it comes to deaf people. Um, in 2011, our numbers were sitting at 430,000, um, and our heart of hearing was well over 3 million. Now, oh, sorry, are, are those impacted by the deaf was well over 3 million in total. Um, so. In South Africa, unfortunately, we have problems like South, learning South African Sign Language is ex incredibly expensive and you can only do it through certain institutions. And at the time of the creation of this app, there was no learning resources available online. Um, no, nothing as a quick reference guide. Um, and you, know, you, you couldn't just go and do a Google search and find some, some content. Uh, so what we did was we set out to create um, an app called FingerTalk, um, which was actually a digitized version of a South African Sign Language Dictionary which was created at the time, uh, or a few years before that. Um, and basically this app is um, aimed at those impacted by the deaf specifically, and as well as, as the deaf. Um, with the deaf, it serves as a, a quick reference guide, as a dictionary, for instance. Um, and for those impacted by the deaf, it serves as a tutorial and uh, learning lessons for the language. Um, so, Figure Talk has also been adopted into three South African universities uh, who have included it in their curricula, um, which really helps us as well. Um, but I'll take you through the rest of it now. Um, so what we currently have in FingerTalk is, uh, as I mentioned, a dictionary with over a thousand signs that is, that is being expanded through our community, include, uh, community engagement program. <laughs> um, and you can search for, for, for signs um, either topic-based or by live search text-based. Um, it has a tutorial for basic, intermediate, and advanced um, sign language with the five uh, criteria. In South African Sign Language, we have five criteria um, that, that make up a sign. Um, we also have a feature called Share Everything, um, as Michelle, Michelle mentioned, is um, we enable you to, uh, to have sign language conversations over WhatsApp by enabling you to share signs across social media. Um, we also have a notice board, which is a community engagement platform as well, which allows organizations uh, to, to spread uh, information through to the community via the app. Uh, Let's continue, there we go. So what we aim to do is exactly what I think what Michal and them are working at in, in Israel is creating an all-inclusive, all-engaging society. We believe there shouldn't be barriers to entry on the social, or, you know, in the social spaces, as well as the, the, um, the employment sector as well. Um, anybody should be able to have access to employment, um, access to education, access to social circles and so on. Um, so we want to create an equal footing for each person. Um, I like the fact that you mentioned you, train, you created a trend. Um, that's exactly what we aim to do is we want to trendify South African Sign Language um, and get it out there among the youth so that they learn it even though they're not impacted by any deaf people. We want them to know it. Um, we actually spoke about creating a finger talk kids version, you know, to have as young as toddlers start learning sign language, basic sign language, um, and getting them involved. I think you, you, you're going to make the biggest changes through your youth. Um, so. 
to date, um, Finger Talk has over 5,000 uh, downloads um, with, with just under 6,000 active users uh, with over 40, se uh, 40 sessions daily. Um, these numbers have also increased since the, the, the time of creation of this presentation. Um, the average amount of users per day has also shot up in the last month. I think since we announced we're coming to zero project, that is now sitting at 15 per day. Um, and all of this is without any marketing budget. This has been a, an, an effort between myself and my wife getting this app out there and building it. Um, so we've, we've managed to, to create quite a footprint, but you know, without marketing budget, you're not going to reach the masses, unfortunately. Um, we've also um, been involved in other awards. Um, we've also uh, been part of the um, SABF Social Innovation and Disability Empowerment Awards in 2017. We were also a feature um, in Deaf TV in South Africa. Um, we have a, a channel for, for, for the deaf, and or we had a channel. It's unfortunately been discontinued, but um, we had a channel for the deaf, and we, we had a feature of, of the app on that channel. Um, yeah, and then obviously we're here at Zero Project as now as well, which is one of the greatest honors we've had. Um, so this is just to show you that Finger Talk not only serves the deaf, but has also improved the lives of the autistic. Um, this is, I received an email from a father a while ago um, letting me know that they're using Finger Talk to communicate with his deaf, oh, oh sorry, with his nonverbal autistic um, daughter. And since then as well, um, other parents have, have, have said the same thing. So it's, Finger Talk is really changing lives. Um, so unfortunately though, financing and sustainability has become really difficult for the app because we're, in, in our country the focus, there isn't enough, I feel there isn't enough focus on, on accessibility and dis disability empowerment just yet. Um, and our corporates haven't quite bought into that space yet, you know, through either CSI programs and so on. We are trying to remedy that, you know, by reaching them and, 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 and working with various uh, deaf organizations. Um, but it is a long road ahead, unfortunately. Until, obviously, um, there's another thing that we've brought in now. Uh, it's a branch off of, um, of Finger Talk. Uh, we initially included it within Finger Talk and have decided to launch it on its own. Um, it's a sister brand called We Sign It. What We Sign It does is it serves as a translation tool um, for corporate information, uh, any, any, any information on behalf of any organization for the deaf. So it'll change the way that deaf people uh, interact with, with organizations by making content available in sign. I'll do a quick live demo for you if you want to zoom in over here. <laughs> um, don't scan the code that's on the, 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 the presentation. It is an old one, unfortunately. I'll make it available through these pamphlets which most of you have in front of you. So as soon as I scan that code, there we go. Up comes a person who will begin signing. There we go. So we are we are essentially creating translated content for corporates to people in South Africa. This is a global service, though. So this will be available everywhere, um, not just for for South Africa. We just need to endorse the content that um, we need the body, the deaf body in that territory, to endorse the content being placed on the platform. I'm just going to kill this quickly. Just describe uh, for those who can't see what uh, we saw in the app. Oh, sorry, yes, okay. So there is a person busy signing uh, and translating the content on that co from that code that I just scanned. So you would have a code placed underneath a piece of content, so terms and conditions or product information. You scan that and you immediately receive a pre-recorded sign language translation for that, for that content. Um, I'm just going to continue. Um, okay, so as mentioned, this was part of the, 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 the future roadmap for Finger Talk, but that has since been uh, since changed and launched on its own. What we see Finger Talk becoming going forward is we want to include a recruitable, as we call it, a um, recruiting platform, recruitment platform for deaf people to find work through the app, um, as well as potentially um, you know partnering and finding uh, interpreters for events and so on. Um, we're also creating or enhancing our science submission tool. So we, we, we have a community engagement uh, program as well where the community can provide us signs, especially if they're not included in our dictionary. They can provide us signs. We have them vetted through our organizations and then we, we include them in the app. Um, and then as well as the social platform and integrated messaging, we would like to bring the, the messaging service that we offer through WhatsApp into FingerTalk itself um, so that we can have FingerTalk be its own integrated platform as well as a trend that people use and the one-stop deaf engagement shop, essentially. Uh, that's me. I'm done. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I, I must say that uh, 
I must say now to the mic, that uh, uh, it's one of the things I love about Zero Project the most is the fact that uh, we all face the same problems globally, and each country or each innovation uh, uh, shares their solution to that problem. Um, uh, please note, for those of you who are not familiar with the uh, uh, sign language, it's not as if Israel can just take the uh, amazing finger talk application and, and, and bring it to Israel because sign language is a cultural thing and differs from uh, uh, culture to culture. Um, uh, but uh, definitely the platform, definitely the idea, amazing. Thank you very, very much. Our next speaker is Amber Zuberi. Zuberi. Zuberi, yes. Uh, Amber is the Deputy Regional Director of the Middle East and North Africa of the International Foundation for Electoral Systems that works to support citizens' right to participate in free and fair elections. And she has 15 years' experience in this, and I will not take her uh, description <laughs> of what you're doing, so surprise us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I should say, everybody. I'm so happy to be here today to talk about how my organization, the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, which I'll refer to as IFAS going forward, works to promote disability rights around the world. My remarks today will have a very specific focus on some of our recent programming in the Middle East and North Africa, um, where we are working to empower deaf communities through the development of electoral sign language lexicons. I don't have the clicker, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, let me start off by noting that IFIS works globally to increase the participation, influence, and representation of all citizens in political processes and governance structures. So IFIS is not per se, a disability rights organization as a standalone. Um, we have standalone disability rights programming, but our broader electoral projects also integrate disability rights into their core design. In Libya, which is the focus of this presentation, we have worked with multiple stakeholders, including government officials from the election management body, government ministries, civil society, including disabled persons organizations and women's organizations, media, and others to promote inclusive political participation since 2011. So as most of you probably know, Libya has been undergoing a political transition since 2011. So IFAS first started working with various stakeholders in Libya right after the revolution and attempted to make sure that marginalized groups were being included in all aspects of the transition um, and moving the country towards an inclusive political and governance process. It became quite, early, became quite clear early on that Libyans with disabilities, just like all Libyans, showed a gr great deal of interest in being part of the process, but unfortunately were less informed um, than the rest of their peers on political issues and therefore often less engaged in the broader political process, but also specifically underprepared to ca knowledgeably cast their votes. Persons with disabilities, as we know, are often disadvantaged because of their lack of access to information. In our work with the disability community, it became even clearer that the deaf community was particularly marginalized, not just on election day, but throughout the various stages of the electoral process. I'd like to read a quote here um, that one deaf Libyan um, told our project. He said, it all started in 2012 when a cousin of mine paid me an unexpected visit. He took me to a polling center and told me to put a tick mark in front of a certain name on the ballot. At that time, I did not know what was going on around me, and there was no sign language translation. No one tried to explain. My voting right was used because I knew nothing about the elections. The same thing happened to many people in the deaf community in Libya. So once we had identified that this was a problem um, and providing information to deaf voters was not easy, we started looking more closely at the issue to try and find a solution that would be appropriate. What made it particular, particularly difficult to provide deaf voters access to information in contexts like Libya 
was that there's no standardized electoral terminology in Libyan Arabic sign language, meaning it was often difficult to translate or interpret political speeches or to clearly define terms um, that were being used in the media or translate voter education materials. And as was noted in the experience of the deaf voter I quoted earlier, this made it very easy for other Libyans um, to easily manipulate deaf voters um, when they were going out to cast their vote. So in order to address this deficit of information, in, in 2015, IFAS worked rigorously with Libyan partners to develop an electoral sign language lexicon with over 300 words related to electoral and political life. Since then, we have also developed a similar sign language lexicon in Morocco, and currently we're working on this in Tunisia and Haiti. IFAS strongly believes in nothing about us without us. So in Libya, IFAS worked closely with deaf persons, Libyan sign language experts, and Libyan interpreters to develop a sign language electoral lexicon which covers terminology for the entire electoral process, starting with the legal framework and following the entire process through the post-electoral period. The lexicon underwent an extremely rigorous process of discussion and debate and many rounds of ground truthing with the Lib Libyan deaf community, which often meant that we changed some of the terms that we were using. It was accompanied by photos and videos. These were made available in PDF, on YouTube, and via a free mobile app which shows the terminology and definitions in Arabic, English, French, and in sign language, and can be used on multiple platforms. And the fact that we also use language, different languages along with the sign language meant that it was also accessible to other people who might be interested in learning um, elect technical election terminology. Once the lexicon was developed, we shared it through a training of trainers, um, and these trainers were then empowered to go out and share the lexicons within their communities. The app was also shared with a number of deaf institutes and schools and their networks. Since then, as I noted, we've also gone through a similar process of development of an electoral sign language lexicon in Morocco and are working towards finalizations of lexicons in Tunisia and Haiti using a similar methodology where we work um, with, in producing all of these products in different languages for deaf and non-deaf um, persons. And in the run-up to the parliamentary and presidential elections in Tunisia, we're working on the same for Tunisian citizens. On the screen, you'll see that I have um, the mobile app that we created. This is the one specifically for Morocco. And you can see that um, this is one of the many chapters that we have, and this one is about the legal framework. Um, it shows a woman and a man signing um, and explaining the terminology, and it's also in English, French, and Arabic. Um, in, in Libya, as in other countries in the Middle East, um, technology and modern technology is often used to promote access for deaf persons, um, and many deaf persons use smartphones and tablets to communicate anyway. So the mobile app ensures that Libyans with smartphones, which is the majority of the population, are able to access electoral terminology easily and ensures knowledge transfer beyond um, traditional trainings. In each app, users can watch videos of deaf persons signing in the local sign language and describing the term. So just finally, I want to talk a little bit about the lessons learned and the impact. Um, for such a methodology to be used successfully, it's very critical to empower deaf persons to take the lead in the development of the lexicon. So not only did we work with deaf people to compile and create the lexicon, um, we also used deaf actors and deaf sign interpreters um, in, in terms of conceptualizing and acting in the videos. Um, in Libya, we also trained sign language teachers from seven institutes for the deaf throughout Libya so they could further filter the terminology down to their students and peers. And we used a training of trainer models so that, that deaf interpreters um, and workshop participants were able to really feel empowered and comfortable with the terminology so that they could then go in and, and share this information with peers and students and others. And this, then this terminology is able to be used beyond the specific election period itself. Over time, we've had, in Libya, over 300 lexicon manuals distributed. 
Um, we've had the app downloaded over 500 times in Libya, and in Morocco it was downloaded over 3,000 times. Um, we've also, to make sure that it's shared across the country, we make sure and um, have trainers that are from all regions, um, in both Morocco and Libya, and Tunisia currently. In Tunisia, the sign language lexicon is being developed. Um, from some of the lessons that we've learned, we know that to make this uh, sustainable, we use a similar platform as we have for the Moroccan sign language. And I know my time is up, so I'm just going to make one last comment. Um, we have successfully par partnered in Libya with the Election Commission on many other disability rights initiatives. And our hope is that we will be able to work with them so that they will use this specific uh, lexicon and many of the sign language interpreters who have been um, trained in the lexicon for elections whenever they should happen in Libya. Same thing in, in Tunisia as well. When we have government officials then utilizing the language um, and using it to spread out um, to, to work on elections, we have further impact. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And. Um, it's my party, I can do what I want to, so this is a great opportunity to tell you that IFES, IFES does uh, uh, more than uh, just a project here, and you are invited to the trail outside, walking the walk and uh, uh, learning more about IFES and the other amazing innovations we have there, and sitting in wheelchairs and trying it out. That's it, Michal, time's up. Barbara Schuster, from, uh, founder and president of Kinderhander. Did I say it right? The, um, Clicker, thank you. No, 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 no to the other, the, the, other side. Oh. You're giving it? Great. So please, Barbara. I have to adjust to the interpreter. No problem. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Barbara Schuster, and I'm so happy to present to you Kinderhände, an association I co-founded in 2006. It's the only association in Austria that offers sign language services and courses for families with deaf and hard of hearing children. This topic is very important to me because I'm myself deaf a deaf child of a hearing family where nobody could sign and I could not hear them. Am I the only one? No. As already mentioned, around 95% of the deaf kids are born in hearing families. Language acquisition is not a given process in these families. There is no given common language which all can hear or see. And in Austria, most parents and their children have no access to Austrian Sign Language, and therefore they experience little or no language exposure. This leads to um, language deprivation and also results in social, academic, and occupational differences. And also for hearing parents with deaf children, they may not get the relevant information about sign languages, deaf community, deaf identity, deaf culture, and um, may not make the informed decisions regarding the future of the deaf child. Do you see the boy on the slide? His mom once said, and I quote, the first deaf person I met was my son. I did not know how to communicate with him. Families with a deaf child often struggle with missing information about sign languages and bilingual communication and where to get it. Although, well, they immedi immediately get counseling about technical devices or speech training, they don't know how to communicate with their deaf child within the family. How does my child acquire a language it cannot hear? What are the alternatives? And how can I learn Austrian Sign Language? To give these parents answers, we founded Kinderhände, Children's Hands, in 2006. Our motivation was and is to fight against the lack of information and the importance of sign language acquisition. 
We are, all bi we are a bilingual team, hearing and deaf experts working together and provide bilingual services. And our service is still unique in Austria. Remember the quote from the mom with a deaf son? Well, her quote has a second part. She said, Kinderhände was a wonderful support where I finally met professionals who could answer my questions and ease my worries. In the last 12 years, Kinderhände has grown. It grew to um, an information and counseling center for parents, teachers, for everyone. We are also a language and communication center for learning Austrian Sign Language for deaf and hearing kids and their parents. And we also created a curricula and training programs for educators for Austrian Sign Language, but also for alternative communication. At Kinderhände, they can network with deaf people and other families and learn also from each other. We develop bilingual materials for the learning experience at home. And we also organize free time activities with Austrian Sign Language, such as swim courses, bicycle tours, or our bilingual kids choir. At Kinderhände, we work and learn bilingually, so children benefit from deaf adults as role models. Here you can see some impressions of our bilingual learning situations for children from six months to 14 years. And you can also see also some of our learning materials that families can use at home. And the outcome is really motivating and has, it will have an impact on people's lives. Parents are informed and get in contact with the deaf community. Families are empowered in using Austrian Sign Language at home. Children can develop their own deaf identity. And deaf people are viewed as the experts in the field. And do you remember the boy who was mentioned in the quote before? He's now 12 years old. His mother and other families fought for a bilingual school education for him. And now he's 12 and he's a happy boy with a strong deaf identity who signs with passion. And we are happy that every year he joins our Kinderhände Christmas Choir where he sings and dances. We know the significance of Kinderhände for families with deaf kids and those who benefit from a visual language. However, we want to find new strategic partnerships for our sign language services. We also want to find new cooperation partners who support our families who are pro sign language. And we also want to develop new learning materials. Our goal is that every deaf child in Austria should get access to Austrian Sign Language from birth on, get the chance to acquire it as a first language, develop a deaf identity and career. And you may know today is also the International Day of Mother's Language Day. That means for deaf people or for children with deaf parents that they have the right to acquire a sign language as their first language. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to talk to you and show you our learning materials after this session outside of the room. Thank you very much.
We're a great group. Very good. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. I think that whoever is not aware of uh, the deaf community and sign language, um, hearing about this deaf identity and, 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 and the wish to stay in the deaf culture is something that is an eye-opener. Uh, it was definitely for me when we began uh, uh, dealing with this. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that if you talk to our panelists later, uh, you can uh, find a lot of more information about that. Our next speakers, uh, we have a trio. Here it is. We have a trio. The first one is um, Amy Haber, Haber Noff. Um, uh, Amy is uh, the department chair, professor, researcher, and Harkin fellow at the St. Cloud State University and Harkin Institute of Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. With her, um, we will hear from Catherine Johnson, director of Confucius uh, Institute. Um, and faculty in the Department of Special Education that promotes the teaching and learning of Chinese sign language, inclusive sign language, uh, Chinese sign language for all students. And Xuan Zheng? Zhang. Zhang. Um, a professor at the... Chongqing. Thank you, Normal University, please. All right, I will start this presentation. I'm Katherine Johnson. I'm the director of the Confucius Institute at St. Cloud State University, which is located in Minnesota in the United States. Just for a little background information, there are more than 500 Confucius Institutes in about 150 different countries, so look for them in your own country. However, ours is the only one that is focusing on including and engaging people with disabilities. And therefore, we're really excited to share this project that focuses specifically on those who are deaf. The background of the project. My first trip to China was in 2000, it's almost 19 years ago. I was with Gallaudet University, which if you know is a university primarily for deaf students. I was one of the few hearing people in that delegation. And so I was in a subculture in a very different culture from my Minnesota, central Minnesota culture. And I really learned a lot about deaf community, deaf identity, and deaf culture and education in China, which was a life-changing experience for me. So fast forward to completing my PhD, ending up at St. Cloud State, and meeting Dr. Knopf. Sometimes we are gifted with great people to work with in our work environments. So I met Amy, we fell in sync with our passion and with our interests in working together and collaborating together in an in interdisciplinary research model. Um, and so of course I invited Amy to come to China. Thankfully it had the same impact on her as it has on me. As we continued to move forward, I also had my eye on another strategic partner uh, with the Harkin Institute just down below us in Iowa. And so met with the director, Joseph Jones, who is also with us today, and shared with him our passion about China, convinced him to come to China, which, I don't know, Joseph, life-changing experience. <laughs> so Joseph came with us to China, and the partnership with the Harkin Institute was merged. And then um, we'll share the story about how we got involved with Chongqing Normal University and some of our other strategic partners in Jilin province, which then, after meeting Joseph Jones, we met Martin Essel at the Harkin Summit in Washington, D.C. And of course, like I do with all great people I meet, we invited Martin Essel to China. And so he came in 2018, and here we are today. So the essence of this project is really to advance the rights of and empower people who are deaf. Um, and that requires really innovative solutions. So similar to other countries, only about 90% uh, about of deaf children have hearing parents. Uh, deaf children in China are educated in the oral method. And uh, they're educated in that method first, and when they fail out, only then are they given the opportunity to learn sign language, or when they um, find it or discover it on their own through their deaf identity development. Um, so currently, sign language is not standardized in the provinces of China, so developing standards for interpreter training programs has been really challenging. Um, China has around 22 million uh, deaf individuals, 
And there's, uh, from my research with the Harkin Institute and my fellowship project, um, I found only about two programs, interpreter training programs, that provide um, high quality sign language interpreters. Um, interpreters are needed and essential to access employment and education. Um, also, building equity and access for deaf leaders is critical, so uh, recognizing the essential importance and value of having colleagues like Dr. Jung, um, who are deaf in every aspect of our project is really critical. Um, that's why we're really fortunate to have, to have Dr. Xuan Zhang. She's the first deaf person to receive a PhD in China, and I think we're pretty fortunate to have her as part of our team. The innovative aspect that we bring to this presentation is really maximizing the power of people-to-people -people exchange. And in that, um, we are working on knowledge mobilization to bridge the knowledge gap that exists between policy and research and practice in China. Uh, we are also developing global competencies and expertise and leadership among the next generation of deaf leaders as we work to bring them as volunteer teachers in our schools for the deaf in Minnesota, in Iowa, and in Delaware as part of our pilot project, which we seek to make not only a U.S.-China school for the deaf partnership, but a global partnership as we expand with other partners uh, who are CI Confucius Institute directors in countries around the world. We're bridging this together with inclusive scientific diplomacy. Scientific diplomacy is doing a collaborative research through the power of people-to-people -people exchange. But you notice that our line is under uh, the word inclusive, meaning that I am hearing and I cannot do adequate research without including my colleagues who are deaf and this is their world. And so the power of including, having inclusive scientific diplomacy um, among researchers is something that we really embrace within this project. And so that brings us to how we are working together through both of these merging into one for advancement and promotion of sign language development and innovative solutions within China. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Xuan Zheng and this is my name sign. I am here from China um, and I, as was mentioned, am the first PhD laureate uh, to be deaf in, in the country. Um, I do speak clearly but uh, I am culturally uh, a deaf, or at least speak, developing my deaf identity at this time. There are two time periods of my uh, career that I'd like to talk about. Uh, the first one being uh, in China and looking at deaf children uh, there and the exchanges that we've had with the United States. And the second one being uh, in the research um, work that I've done with Amy. In comparing the two countries, I do see some similarities and differences, um, specifically in the realm of deaf education. What I feel is very important is that deaf people be involved in the education of other deaf people and that they also be involved in the research on the deaf community. We were very uh, honored, uh, Amy and I, to, be, to receive the Harkin Fellowship Award uh, and that was uh, important in us being able to do this type of work. When I was able to go to the US and work at Metro Deaf School, uh, in Minneapolis, um, I had a number of experiences that were quite formative. You can see some pictures here on the slide of the interactions I've had with some of the students at that school. Uh, fortunately, in the area, there are a lot of, school, a lot of students who have backgrounds from different uh, nations, and so they've sort of identified with, with me. Um, there's also some deaf-blind students that were there. But we taught them how to write in, in the Chinese language. Uh, we taught them how to um, do Chinese martial arts um, and Chinese dance. Uh, we served them Chinese tea and taught them generally a lot about Chinese culture so that they could have a bit of an, um, an experience with uh, Chinese culture and Chinese sign language um, in their own schools. 
So we're hoping now to add Chinese sign language uh, additionally to uh, the work that we're doing. I, I'm very proud uh, to have had that experience. Uh, I feel like a cultural ambassador uh, from one country to another. And I, I think that's um, important in setting up these types of diplomatic relationships with uh, between countries. And I thank both Catherine and Amy for their support in us being able to do that. So our time is out, but if we can just have a minute to wrap up. Um, having strategic partnerships is really important important and we appreciate the partnership with the Harkin Institute and also with the Zero Project. And we'll just go to this last um, slide that um, just talks about we have a lot of projects coming, um, coming available soon in scaling up our project. We're looking for partners and if you are interested or available, we would love to partner with you. Mm -hmm. And okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, and uh, good for you girls. Uh, three uh, people fitting in one uh, slot. Uh, that's a mission impossible for me, so way to go. Our last but not least speaker, Monica Hader, Manager Director of uh, Equalizent. Not bad, good, uh, which is uh, based in Austria, and I'm trying to talk without my glasses, no way. Uh, she makes it an issue to use all of her possibilities uh, in order to create a barrier-free society in which we can live together. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Can I have the tricker, please? Of course. Yes. Thank you so much. So, so. Okay, my name is Monica and my sign name is Monica. Um, it's a pleasure for me to speak about our mission or my mission, Education for Deaf People. Um, because uh, when I founded Equalisen as a training and competence center 15 years ago, uh, there was a situation that um, sign language was not recognized in Austria. There was no further education for deaf people and deaf people were mostly uh, worked in low-level jobs. So, and that was the reason why I, I built up a competence center like Equalicent. Uh, so, just let, does it work? Yes. So, oh no, sorry. Now it works. So, but what I need, I need also the help, I think, because I want to show you what we are doing in the Ethical Ascent with a little video, but I think I can do it with the tricker. Can the technique can do it? Does it work? Can you operate the video? There is nobody up. Oh, thank you. So, there's a video about our work. Normally, there is also music on, but it doesn't matter. <laughs>
Wow, five minutes or I can't believe it. <laughs> okay, so I, I have to go back to the slides, how I do it. So, now, okay, so, so. <laughs> Yes, so, um, yes, the, uh, you have seen our video and you have seen our team. We have now 66 employees and 30 of them are deaf or hard of hearing, but all of them are excellent in sign language. Uh, and uh, with this team, we developed a training center. I think that's an outstanding one in Europe. And we do also a lot of sensitization, like you have seen the diversity ball. The next one is on the 5th, 4th of May. If you're in Vienna, you have to come and visit this ball. It's very special. It's, a, I think, the only one barrier-free event we have in Austria like this. And we also have uh, developed an exhibition for uh, people who want to experience uh, the, the world of deafness and sign language. It's a permanent exhibition. It's now situated and placed in the first district. Um, so, uh, we have done this, and, uh, but there are a lot of other centers in Europe, they also have done a little bit, but not in this way, not uh, how we have done it, in a unique, holistic concept. Um, I think we are the only private, I know, we are the only private education institute for deaf people of its kind in Europe, providing the holistic model with self-motivated, selected, and qualified deaf trainers, bespoke educational materials, access to education, also for people that are more far away for education, and also living in, in other areas with uh, visual class, classrooms. And we are also specialized in professional development for our organization. And all this we want to bring in a, in a package for people who want to make an institute like we are. Uh, there are facts. There are one million deaf in Europe. There are a lot of deafness in education. Up to 75 persons are functionally illiterate. And the unemployment rate for deaf people in Europe is 70 percent higher than average. Um, and uh, we have to spend a lot of public spending. It's about more than 7.8 billion per year in Europe. And that's why, because education is in, uh, it's only offered in spoken and written language. And we want to eliminate this wall. And we want to eliminate this wall with our solution to, with instructions in sign language, sign language oriented methods and didactics that we have uh, developed, training with and for deaf trainers, and empowerment for our participants through content, methods, and role models. And we want to support them, to integrate them in the workplace. And we have a big success rate. More than 70% of our equalescent students find a job afterwards. So, we think we have three winners with our system yeah, when we develop this social franchise system. They're the franchises, they should, have, they should speak sign language and they get a wallet business model. They're deaf students, they get education and jobs. And also the government, they can reduce their social spendings. And we have goals. Now we are working at the, developing the, the, the social franchise model. Next year we want to pilot it in Germany, in Hamburg, with partners in Hamburg and in Berlin. And after them we want to spread out in Europe. We start with Germany, France and Italy because there we have a lot long-term partnerships with, with a lot of partners from, uh, from different uh, European programs. And we think in seven years' time, we can, we can have 40,000 deaf people trained, of which 70% have found a job, and a lot of savings on social spendings for the governments. And there's a forecast, 450,000 people uh, are in Europe waiting for this, and uh, this is a potential for other partners. So I think we have, for a really complex problem in our society, I think we have a simple solution, education, bring education to the people. So, 
So great. Thank, thank you, you for this at attention. And I, I have some material here in front of me. If you're interested, please pick it up afterwards. Thank you very, very much. Again, I think it's amazing to see here these amazing uh, uh, presentations and projects. We're all dealing with the same problem, finding solutions that, in a way, some of them sound very similar, but they're they have their uniqueness and, and, and local uh, flavor to it, and it's great. Do I have a time for questions and answers? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. That's a long time. First of all, way to go, panel. And we have questions, please. Fantastic presentations. In our office, we have people who are deaf and people who are not deaf we find that it's very expensive to have ASL interpreters, and we have found significant success with the WhatsApp and WeChat. And we also find that it's difficult for people who are deaf to get jobs if they're not excellent writers in the native language of their country. And so I wonder, because deaf culture is so important and sensitivity to these languages is so precious, how do you feel with the new assisted technology of speech to text? And how do you feel about making sure that people who are deaf have good enough writing skills in the native language of your country? Thank you for the question. Who would like to answer from uh, the panel? Anyone? Tools? OK. Uh, Yes, please. Okay. I'll open this question and then I hope Dr. Zhang can follow me. Um, do you want to watch them or do you want me to interpret for you? So, right, the two questions about technology use and how to. Two questions about technology use and how to ensure uh, writing skills. Uh, sure, I can address that. That, that is certainly a, a big problem that we see all around the world um, today. More and more deaf people um, are using hearing aids and, and clicker implants and going into mainstream instruction settings. That might be because their parents have chosen an oral education instead of a sign language education. When I first uh, flew to the United States, I, I did some interviews uh, at the deaf school. Um, and I saw that the, uh, I heard that the number of deaf students enrolling there had been going down. We're finding the same thing in China as well. I, I seem to think that this is probably um, an issue that uh, countries all over the world are dealing with. My feeling is that if students are going into mainstreaming environments and they have um, cochlear implants or hearing aids, we have to remember that those uh, assistive technologies do not convert them into hearing people all of a sudden. They might get closer to being able to access spoken language in those environments, but we can't simply um, leave them alone without any support because those problems will continue to surface. Uh, so we do need to engage in important monitoring. We need to make sure that they're uh, developing emotionally and uh, developing a healthy identity as students in those settings, that they have peers, and that those um, the, that type of moder um, monitoring and potentially using a bicultural and bilingual uh, approach to the situation will help ensure that those students are ready um, to enter the job market, that they have the literacy skills that they need um, to be able to have careers that last a lifetime. If we, if we dismiss um, these students' literacy uh, shortcomings as, oh, that's just because they're deaf, we're, we're really doing them a disservice. Okay. So we have a number of tools that we can use um, to try to address these types of situation. And, and sign language instruction uh, alongside um, a different language of instruction uh, is one way that we can maximize um, our achievement in that realm. Okay, thank you. I think you also asked specifically, and correct me if I'm uh, mistaken, um, uh, the use of text and you need to know the language in order to text, 
and sometimes people who are deaf, their linguistic uh, skills are, are uh, um, you know, speak, uh, they write differently. Um, I know we have that situation in Israel. I can tell you that uh, Zero Project is represented by more than 80 countries, I think, and uh, note that the WhatsApp and, and all the other uh, technological uh, uh, solutions that use text-to-speech, uh, you are counting on the fact that your language is adaptable to those uh, solutions, and in many cases, languages like in Israel, the Hebrew is not uh, such a um, financially uh, uh, relevant uh, um, uh, language to, to put in funds and, and create such things, so it's rarer. Uh, that's also something we need to uh, take into consideration. Okay, more questions, please. Oh, yes, of course. I just have a quick uh, addition to this, what uh, my colleague said. Bilingual means writing, spoken language and signing. And um, for, for a lot of children, um, they can't read or can write. And it's really a problem because they just grew up in an oral world. They don't know. They don't have the one language or the other. They don't sign, but they can't speak either. They don't have the spoken language. And that's the importance of my work and what we do in our team. That's bilingual. They should grow up having a sign language and a spoken language which they can write and read. And this is so important for them. And this, you know, it's their decision then. They have both. They can use both and either sign or write. But they have both. They have the ability to to be in both worlds, the hearing and the deaf, signing and writing or reading the spoken language of the country. And that's the most important part, what, what we do and what we, our work is for. And we hope that in the future it will all change to the bilingual way. Great. Thank you very much. Any more questions from the floor? No questions. Very good. So uh, anybody want to add one last statement? Yes, I would like to add something because uh, I think it was very important what my was the, our two deaf um, the, the signers said um, because uh, I think in Austria we have only seven bilingual classes in, and all the other deaf children are in in in, in, in main classes or maybe they are integrated, uh, but or they are in in a special school, but they don't offer sign language at the school. So there is no subject of sign language. So there is a big lack uh, during school time. And this is also a problem after school time. Yes? So that's why we are working afterwards, but you never can feel the lack was what happened during the school time. Yeah? So I think there must be a, a big, 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 big change. Yeah. Just make one. Yeah. I'd like to end this panel with just a, a very um, poignant uh, emphasis on understanding uh, the abilities of the people who are deaf, that provided access to education, provided access to language and equity in their programs, and uh, having equal curriculum to their hearing peers, um, then people who are deaf will be able to reach their full potential. And so I think that's a common theme that all of us have shared about, is reaching their full potential is really what we're looking for through all of the different projects that we shared today. Thank you very much. Um, and if nobody else wants to add anything, great. So I would like to end uh, with a tribute to, to uh, the person I mentioned when I uh, made my presentation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a CEO of an organization with 130 uh, employees. Uh, more than half of them are people with disabilities, all types of disabilities. And I feel very privileged uh, uh, to be uh, in such a, a working environment, uh, learn every single day from my employees. And specifically, I was telling you about Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Shiovitz, who uh, uh, runs the program, the Paid Forward program. Uh, he is an amazing, inspirational guy uh, who was born deaf uh, to hearing parents. He was uh, um, uh, operated and giving a cochlear uh, uh, solution and decided he wants to uh, uh, learn, stay attached to the deaf community by becoming an interpreter. And uh, he learned to be a professional interpreter. And then when he got older, in his 20s, he decided his identity is a deaf person. And he took out the cochlear uh, aid. He went back to being a deaf 
person uh, totally. And today he is our inspiration. Uh, in our organization, we conduct uh, uh, lunches uh, in signing language. Um, uh, those are quiet lunches where employees come and uh, the language to be talked is sign language. Um, and uh, uh, we do try to make sure that uh, in, in, in every event, in every uh, big meeting, there is either interpreter or um, uh, captioning. And the idea is, I have learned to talk a little slower, <laughs> a little more clearer, uh, to listen, and to listen not only to what I hear, but to what I see, body language, mimics, uh, uh, etc. And again, I would like to use this floor to thank Jonathan, Shoshana, um, uh, Racheli, and uh, the rest of my amazing employees who teach us every single day. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you to my panelists, very inspirational. And let's uh, remember what I said, walk the walk. Do not miss the trail. Thank you, guys.